Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we'll bring you day 296 of Russian invasion into Ukraine, with Alexei Rostovich, advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel, and Mark Fagan, Russian opposition politician. The main news of today are new missile strikes on the critical infrastructure of Ukraine, some changes in targeting, and could Patriot systems be helpful in providing protection from these volleys? Heavy fighting on Bakhmut Saladar line. The Russian army is retreating in some parts of the front, around Kriminaya Svato. Putin's visit to Belarus on December 19th. Is there any threat to Lukashenko and his life? Commanding General of Ukraine Military Valery Zeluzhny and his list of what does Ukraine need to win this war. Capability of Putin's regime for the third wave of mobilization. Central African Republic. Interesting news coming from there. And ninth package of anti-Russian sanctions implemented by European Union as well as new candidates from Mark for personal sanctions. Enjoy! Dear friends, glad to see you all on Fagin Live and Privateer Station. It is Friday, 1 minute past 10 in Kiev, 1 minute past 11 in Moscow. We are doing that stream with Alexei Rostovich, as usual. Glad to see you, Alexei. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, dear viewers. Day 296 of this war, and it is Friday. We hope that those 73,000 who are watching us already will use this opportunity to share a link to that stream and call upon more people and their friends who haven't joined us but wanted to to not forget and come here. And also click the like button, just like those 20,000 which already have done so. And of course subscribe to Fagin Live, to Alexei Rostovich, and to the Privateer Station if you are listening or watching that in English. That definitely helps. Yes, what? I forgot to put my headphones on. Who, me? Uh, no, no, me. Okay, okay, we'll wait for you. Uh, young people, I don't know what he th is thinking about, but that's okay. I don't know if you saw it today, but people uh, from the humor universe uh, made me smile. Uh, we're being portrayed there in a fun caricature way. There is one guy representing me. Actually, pretty good job. I need to say hi to him. Do you hear us now? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's all good. Okay. It's uh, a little bit of a slow connection on your end, but still we can hear you fine. Let's talk about what's happening. We opened the map and we're showing your son. Tell us something. Well, the main news of the day is not the map, though. The main news is more hits on the critical infrastructure, which are a little different from the earlier hits, uh, because uh, glorious Russian strategic uh, missile command decided that uh, it might make sense to actually attack uh, the command centers of air defense systems of Ukraine. Usually it is done before uh, any other strike, but uh, well, nine, mo nine months of war, they finally got the idea. They uh, had about 70 missiles launched at us. There were a lot of calibers, 22. There were launches from Su-34, Su-35 jets. And they used some mid-range uh, missiles to try to target our brains, our command centers for uh, air defense and missile defense systems. So that was somewhat of a different situation from the usual. A lot of calibers. Uh, in this volley, so they, they even uh, tried launching from three or four different locations today, and out of 72, I think we shut down 60, or something like that, little over that. So 86, 84 percent were shut down. Several questions in relation to that attack. If you guys had Patriot systems, which are being one of the major topics of discussion. Would you have a higher percent of uh, shutdown of those missiles? Depends upon which missiles, Mark. Today they used S-300s, which are refitted to shoot at the ground targets. 
And uh, those targets that are closer to the border, like Kharkov, they were and Dnieper, were uh, the ones shot with S 300s. And they're mostly targeting infrastructure over there. Patriots are very different depending upon modification. Some modifications allow to solve problems of uh, missile defense, others uh, only target the uh, other targets. So it's, yeah, some of them are more fit for ballistic targets, others for uh, cruise targets. I don't know if they will give us the latest, uh, probably not uh, the latest generation of uh, this system. Those are probably only available within the United States, but uh, they probably will not give us the first modification either, because the first one was uh, produced at the end of 80s. It was uh, used even back in Israel in those days for their defense. So they probably will get, get us something in the middle, which covers both uh, cruise and ballistic to a good degree. And of course, if they were in those locations where they were targeting uh, infrastructure, they would have shot pretty well. So there were about 40 missiles targeting Kiev, we shot down 37. If we had two Patriots, we probably could have shot down all 40. Although we need to understand that there is a, it is a game of probability and uh, positioning. And even with them, um, you're never sure if you'll get 37 or, or 40. Even if you put... Uh, cover your whole territory with uh, these systems, there'll be a chance that some of the missiles may slip through. Well, we need to bring it up, right? Because we have Western allies of Ukraine watching us. Of course, of course, uh, the needs of the country are huge. We are one of the biggest countries in Europe and uh, there is a ton of different objects that could be targeted, that present some uh, interest to our foes and we have to maneuver our existing capability to try to cover as many of them as we can but uh, of course the territory is huge so we do need more hardware to be able to protect it more effectively there was a bit of a break in uh, these volleys usually they do it in, on mondays today was friday i understand there is no reason why they're doing it just whenever they aggregate enough missiles that's when they should but still, after these uh, drones, uh, strange drones that hit Diagileva and Engels airfields and uh, damaged some of the strategic bombers, do you think there was a pause, they were thinking or analyzing some of the results of these hits? I'm not uh, pressing you to acknowledge that uh, who done it, I, I know Ukraine wasn't. They we're just discussing what the evil tanks are saying. So they looked at the spares and they figured that we don't have to be afraid of them because they probably will not be able to outfit too many of these UAVs and we shouldn't be afraid. And then we probably should do another volley. Or perhaps their reasoning was, well, there is no other option. We don't really have a choice. Uh, that's the only weapon we can use more or less effectively. So. Yeah, and we'll just need to sit in a bunker for a little longer. Do you think that was part of that ideation? And do you think that they need to be expecting a return hit? Mark, these categories are not dependent upon each other in a linear fashion. The fires of their military bases or destruction of their airfields are not directly related to their activities with the missile attacks. We do not have parity with them. If we had missile complexes with at least 1500 kilometers range uh, versus their 2000, then it would be somewhat comparable situation. Then we would probably attack them and probably not even wait for them to shoot us, but probably do it preemptively if we see them preparing. But given the fact that Ukraine is very limited in its means, we are not capable to do that as a revenge, uh, to order. It is not so simple. However, some evil tongues in Russian Federation did mention that um, on a few occasions uh, there were some successful operations, precluding. I remember when in Novorossiysk one of the ships uh, was hit, exploded. Um, it happened a day before it was supposed to go out to sea and shoot missiles at Ukraine.
also on the airfields where the strategic bombers were destroyed. They were actually some pictures showing that those destroyed bombers and damaged bombers had already Han missiles under their wings. So you could actually see that in one of the pictures that they were fitted for uh, the next mission. And uh, yeah, we saw that, that instead of 100, they only had 70. Today they only had uh, 38 uh, air-based missiles probably due to the lack of uh, ability of do making these strikes because three strategic bombers are fully destroyed one is uh, somewhat damaged and uh, it probably did produce a good impression on them because they indeed moved that fleet from their airfields where they were based before to murmansk and somewhere deep into siberia and it does tell us that, first of all, they are afraid of these uh, possible explosions on their airfields and uh, they even are ready to face a more complicated logistics uh, of taking off from a further airport and then flying into Engels, ref getting refitted there, trying to do that quickly uh, to minimize the risk of being attacked and then jumping from there again and making that missile strike. So after that, let's sum it up. After these events, it's much harder for them to do the airstrikes. Will it happen again? Will we limit their capability again? We'll see. I don't know yet. I don't know. Uh, maybe they'll listen to you and decide to, hey, uh, he's uh, telling us there is a risk. We should probably go sit in a bunker. I think it's good for them to sit in a bunker. The more they do, the less they're outside. So, okay. Well, let's uh, thank our friends for watching us. Um, thank you for joining us on Friday once again. And uh, let's go back to the map and see what's happening on the map. So, the main situation there is uh, near Bakhmut Solidar. This is a very difficult fight, a lot of shooting, a lot of uh, fighting in uh, forested areas around it. Both sides are suffering casualties. Russian side suffers more than we do, but it is not a simple situation for us either, because uh, there is also tanks working, there is artillery, and just the intensity of fighting. So that you understand, Russian company, uh, upon arrival to the theater near Bakhmut, in three days it is not, uh, it loses its uh, battle capability. After sanitary losses in three days, it is uh, technically incapable of carrying out tasks and should be rotated. Another interesting thing, uh, on Svatova area, there are two parts of the front where they violated their own orders and started running. So these are probably first harbingers of uh, the future big crack in their front because our defense forces are not weakening there we're continuing the pressure and this may produce its own results okay that's good um i think that's it on the map right let's talk about belarus once again not in the context that it's war tomorrow but you probably heard the news that on the 19th putin is going to visit belarus um, I don't think he will arrive to Minsk, he's not suicidal, right? And the first reason, I think, that Lukashenko just doesn't want to go to Russia, like he did before, to Sochi, to Bacharov stream, or to Rublyovka in Moscow. And now, after McKay's death, he decided, oh, to F with that, and I'm not coming. So Putin has to come himself. One needs to be complete idiot to not understand that Putin really wants uh, Lukashenko to partake in this war. Uh, otherwise, why would he go there? For what? And Lukashenko is probably afraid to be murdered in the Kremlin, so it's an old Russian tradition to execute ambassadors uh, of uh, the allies and adjacent nations. So what do you think about all that? I will be that proverbial fool today, Mark. Oh, okay. Uh, elaborate. 
I don't believe he is actually trying to make Lukashenko join the fight. I think one of the main reasons is Lukashenko's contacts with the West. The death of Mackay could also add to this bucket, yes. And he probably, I think, he might want to get Lukashenko to not talk to the West that much. And of course, the end goal would be to make him to partake in this war, but again, Lukashenko will be maneuvering as much as he can to avoid it. He'll probably be throwing groups of 30 uh, armored vehicles towards the border with Ukraine for some training and then withdrawing them at the last moment and doing some training exercises and checking readiness checks uh, with his military, but he'll be maneuvering to avoid that. So, a blunt question. Do you think they can kill him? Do you mean to come to Minsk and kill Lukashenko? No, not like that. To murder him, to involve his uh, successor, in uh, to entangle his successor in this war. And I'm not saying in Minsk, just anywhere. They might, but who can guarantee that there would not be a public revolt in Belarus, which at the very least will limit the use of uh, Belarus military in any war. And where is the guarantee that after understanding that it is Russians who murdered Lukashenko, Belarus will, military will not revolt and uh, join the general populace? So, I'd be careful with that idea. Well, you know, they probably will put the usual situation like he ate some raw mushrooms or uh, got a stroke or something. Well, after the death of Mackay, I think everybody understands. Uh, we'll, we'll get the idea what uh, who prepared these mushrooms and why. It would be, of course, cool if political detective stories would be real in life, but, you know, I don't think that'll work. Well, listen, Mackay died. Maybe even 90% uh, are talking that he died of natural reasons, natural causes. But there are still 10% that will continue causing conspiracy theories. Lukashenko, you know, Mark, Lukashenko is also not a simple figure. He has his own special services. His team understands that there is a risk to his life. And they're doing their best to protect him. So the conversations I think they'll be having would be about Russia, Belarus and China. The conversations with uh, the West by Belarus and transfer of weapons to Russia. And continuous training of Russian mobilized on Belarus training grounds. And by the way, Lukashenko is resisting as much as he can to avoid using anything from Belarus territory onto Ukraine. Those Shahids that I misspoke and said they came from the north, they didn't. They came from the south. Lukashenko doesn't allow Putin to use uh, Belarus as the ground for attacks on Ukraine. So I do not believe that uh, he will be joining the fight anytime soon. Oh, I believe uh, they'll continue talking to him to try to convince him to join the fight, but I don't think he'll agree to. I'm with you, Alexei, I'm with you on that. I think they'll continue pressing him, but then that basically leaves them a choice to either continue talking to him or to execute him and uh, hope for the successor. Uh, right now, on the territory of Ukraine, they have about 200,000 of their troops fighting. On the, along the perimeter, there's probably another 150,000. And then there is maybe another 50, 70,000 being prepared somewhere in the Russian training facilities. So, that's the thing. If they throw all these guys, uh, and we eventually destroy them. Where do they? What What do they use to outfit the next? What do they use to get the next wave of the army ready? The only easiest way for them is the warehouses in Belarus. 
And they already transferred about 100,000 shells and uniforms and other things from there. There's probably another 100,000 in those warehouses, but they're now the ones dedicated to solving national threats and other interests uh, of Belarus. So you'd want to talk to the top leader of Belarus uh, who can make a decision to take that risk and release this ammo to support Russia. So, and again, they're easier than Iranian. They don't, you don't need to change anything to retrain for anything. They're the same, essentially, articles. And uh, I think Putin understands that Belarus is not going to join the fight, but they at least can use, get the military and get ammo from them. And he does need to talk to the top level person in Belarus to get that yes, because uh, the volumes of support are pretty significant and Belarus doesn't have endless uh, warehouses. And there are risks uh, for Belarus too, because you never know that uh, population may go into another uprising and revolt. And if military is out of ammo, out of uh, stockpiled items, they will be weaker. They will not be able to effectively suppress this revolt. So that is definitely a risk for Belarus. And the other uh, reason for Putin to be there and to asking for these, to be asking for these ammo and weapons, is uh, just in case to make sure Belarus doesn't have much. If all of a sudden they decide to join the fight on the side of Ukraine that they would not have much resources. So, and besides that, they do need to refit their troops. Because, yeah, they do have another 200,000 somewhere, but half of them are with their naked butts and uh, no ammo. They, their main reasons, their main issues are even uniform, not even the ammo to start with. And a lot of Sanitary losses occur even before any of them get to the front because a lot of their troops uh, go down with seasonal flu and other diseases. So I would think providing a proper supply, proper logistics uh, to these troops would be task number one before uh, providing ammo and uh, relocating them to the actual front. So, and transfer, and I think that's what Putin is going to solve by a visit to talk to Lukashenko, and it is a conversation that needs to happen between them directly, because uh, it already touches upon the strategic resources of Belarus. Okay, I understand you, but uh, for Putin to fly to Belarus, why? Well, because Lukashenko is not going to Moscow. There are video conferences, calls and other capabilities to talk to each other. I don't think, Mark, they will be using that technology because uh, he might need to uh, make uh, scary faces and show some compromising materials and folders uh, or whatever else he has on Lukashenko. He needs to do that tete -a -tete in person. Well, you know, there are different things that can be there. And you think there's still something that uh, Lukashenko is not aware of? Well, I don't know exactly what nature materials they have, but there could be something like, hey, we caught your ambassador talking to the West or negotiating about some things or, or whatever. But the main difficulty that Putin also has in Belarus direction is that during the summit in Samarkand, China gave Belarus a higher ranking than to Russia. So. This is uh, definitely a headache for Putin, and he will be trying to resolve that headache as well in, during his visit. And Lukashenko might actually say back, hey, Chinese precluded me from joining this war, so go talk to Chinese. Um, that would be an interesting answer. Okay, from the news, Biden recently confirmed that there will be a soon transfer of air defense system, systems to Ukraine. As uh, some of the journalists uh, report, before his uh, travel from Delaware to Washington, he did uh, mention to journalists that uh, these systems uh, will be transferred to Ukraine within minutes. Minutes are ticking. I don't know what he meant there, but... You know, Mark Zeluzhny did uh, publish a list of exact items that we need to win. He did say that air defense systems are good, but in order to win, 
over Russia on the battlefield with the current 200,000 and possible 200,000 that may join the fight on their side. We need a group of military that is faster in uh, fitting, in logistics and is better equipped than Russian troops. We can and we will continue hitting them on the fronts, but we do want to rely upon the ground operations and not just uh, the armor, but also supply vehicles. And our general command is outlining exact numbers of what we need in order to resist and to prevail over Russian Federation on the battlefront. He gave the nomenclature and he gave the quantities. And I would be much more delighted to hear not about the air defense systems, but about transfer of tanks, armor and field artillery. And also additional vehicles for logistics, for mine sweeping, mobile mine sweeping systems, etc. Because most people are talking about air defense, but air defense never wins wars. The wars are won by ground troops that have tanks, armored vehicles, artillery. It's hard to argue with that. All right, uh, let's discuss another news. Maybe there's something behind it. Uh, Politico, a uh, publication that you, you're probably aware of. Did you ever comment there? Perhaps. Okay, so Politico published that NATO might publish uh, an appeal or uh, to Russia to immediately stop the war in Ukraine and withdraw troops. Do you think that could produce any impression? Because appeal to Russia, Moscow will not follow that. Do you think there is a chance for that? We, of course, do not believe everything that media publishes, uh, even though it is American media, uh, which uh, prides itself on all the fact checking. Um, still, do you think? An ultimatum would have a weight. Mark, I don't see West working like that. West, the West doesn't uh, pause ultimatums like this, especially in public. They make offers and then they see how an idiot is not uh, agreeing with them. And they give different options first. Remember Kissinger with his message who did uh, the foreplay action in this regard? Uh, there was a plan of Kissinger. If you just a reminder of viewers, get back to the situation of the border before 24th of February. Crimea remains with Russia until Putin dies uh, to be resolved later and Ukraine joins NATO 100%. So, in the return of Donbass, uh, Lugansk and Crimea will be discussed later, at a later time, everybody understands after Putin's death, right? And for now, we will we do a ceasefire and uh, hold peace for for a while at least. So Kissinger is not a simple figure. I think he was used uh, to make that statement on purpose, and probably there was a additional message sent through him uh, unofficially to Russian leadership. What will what can be uh, threatened uh, at Putin's regime? So, in, in case of an ultimatum, not direct strikes, not missiles and jets on the Russian territory. I don't see that happening. But uh, they can threat that uh, they'll start supplying certain equipment to Ukraine if Russia is unresponsive to these offers. And uh, that could be armor, that could be additional artillery that would allow Ukraine to create uh, strike groups that will be capable of breaking the front and uh, kicking Russian troops out of certain territories. And I think it is not going to be now on the level of rhetoric on this trip drop uh, tactics of supply. But I think it will be happening now at a higher pace. And also the second thing that could be going on is uh, the actual use of Russian resources frozen on the West to pay for the support of Ukraine. Uh, Im immediate assets of Russian oligarchs, uh, assets of their energy companies, of Rosneft, uh, Gazprom and the like. And then eventually shutting down the corridors for natural gas and oil to the levels until they die, basically. So these are probably the immediate three things that come to mind when you think about how can the situation be affected. 
And they do understand, the West understands that Putin is really stretching his limits and trying to throw these additional 200s. That's his last attempt. And there are jokes already in the meme sphere that uh, Zaluzhny quoted the number of 200,000 so that Russians could start planning how many body bags they need to buy from China. And basically all the diplomacy is uh, leading Putin to try to understand that uh, your offensive will not lead you to anything, will not give you any advantage. Um, neither Iranian weapons, nor more troops on the front, nothing will help you to improve your situation. So the best thing you can do is withdraw and start negotiating. Uh, unfortunately, Putin is not a smart man. Um, and he is also being propped by some Russian ideology that uh, basically tells that if you continue hitting at the same point for 300 years, you may actually get your result. In Europe, they would have a change of epochs, a change of dynasties, change of countries. There will be science te technical revolutions in Europe. In Russia, they just with their doggedness, they think they may achieve certain goals. And the problem is that they sometimes do believe that achieving the goal will uh, pay for all the losses that were suffered while achieving that goal. For example, they raised half a million troops getting Ukraine, but at the end they'll be able to recapture new territory and rebuild their military complex and will be threatening uh, the whole world again. So these convictions are somewhat driving his stance and uh, prepping him for that super effort. Another one that Zaluzhny and Zelensky and Kuleba and everybody else warned people about. And the West, uh, of course, is also telling Putin that this is not a good attempt, this is not a good strategy. So right before he goes uh, ways deep into that second wave, everybody is telling him this is a stupid idea, it will not lead you anywhere. Near Bakhmut you've been trying for three months, already a fourth month, and you still haven't taken that small town. And what are you going to do after? Are you ready for the third super effort? And how much will you need to aggregate another group uh, on the background of sanctions and all the limits uh, imposed on you and your regime? I'm sincerely concerned uh, in his capability to even uh, carry anything successfully in, as a third wave. I cannot completely exclude that, but I think he'll pay for that with his uh, crack butt, because uh, everybody is telling him, don't do that. It's, it's going to be stupid, you will never achieve anything that you desire. But uh, I think his, yeah, his goal is an attack on the infrastructure, is to cause another wave of refugees, uh, to try to cause some chaos in Europe. Uh, Europe tells him don't do that, but he is an idiot, he continues to push the same line. Plus he is also surviving as a political figure and as a physical person, because I think he understands that he it is his last ditch effort to survive. So with these three things, these three fingers up his butt, he's uh, still pushing. And he's not listening to the West. So the West understands that they first of all need to block his air attacks, more air defense systems and ground attacks, more armor, more equipment and sanctions that will break his economic back and not let him finance this war. Okay. So we have 311,000 watching us, about 40,000 of you click the like button. We've been live for about um, 33 minutes and you see me coughing here. Yeah, sorry, I had a strong cold and uh, that's my consequence of that coughing is still here, still lingering. But I'm okay, I'll get over that. So, several more interesting news, very interesting news. I don't know if you know, but there was uh, an unexpected event that happened in uh, Central African Republic. You'll probably be surprised. I won't, I already know about it, but I can make uh, it seem that I'm surprised. Okay, so those evil tongues and, and etc. There are some publications uh, coming from Central African Republic that the head of Russian house uh, 
somebody with the last name City suffered an explosion and uh, was heavily wounded by an anonymous package with explosives. And uh, a group of officers for the international security, so basically KGB guys, are reporting that uh, he suffered serious damage upon trying to open a package with explosives which exploded in his hands and he's been transported to one of the hospitals where he is treated and Russian news also confirming that, that there was attempt on his life of course Prigozhin came out uh, on the media and said that uh, this guy was threatened indeed and he neglected security measures and he was told to not open boxes directly and um, reiterated some of the local sentiment about Russians having to get out of Africa and I need to remind that this is uh, happening right after after those uh, dogs eyes were sent to different embassies of Ukraine around the world and I think in Madrid there was another package with explosives that uh, took away uh, the tore two fingers of the hand of one of the workers of Ukrainian embassy so what do you think there is uh, is there any connection between all these events did somebody uh, took uh, Sute's fingers away as a result of earlier activities and some evil tongues are pointing fingers towards Ukraine no mark I think they these guys just mix their own packages and sent it to himself to to themselves or maybe they were just packaging that package and it exploded things happen okay let's not talk about ukraine then uh, but central african republic is one of the home bases for uh wagner private mercenaries and uh, they're definitely on the nerves of uh, france britain and united states by their presence in africa and sticking into certain things here and there in Central Africa, in Mali, in uh, other locales where they behave arrogantly. And we discussed how their headquarters were bombed by an unknown plane. Unknown plane, exactly. Nobody knows what plane was. It just flew, dropped the bomb and left. And now City got that package. I think, Mark, that could be their internal fighting. Neither West nor Ukraine is using these methods. Because sending these explosive packages is uh, a year before the a century before the last one. Technology, it's very unreliable. Because if you want to assassinate somebody, you do that. You do not play around with packages and stuff. Because you never know, you cannot control who opens that. Uh, well, that's the destiny, you know. Maybe it was successful. Mark, it's much easier to hire local guns who will uh, take a grenade launcher and take the, his vehicle out on some stop sign or a turn when he'll slow down. Package is very unreliable. Who will open? How will open? What would be the circumstances? And if you, you cannot even use that as a warning because there is no um, battle task to warn anybody. The task is to execute. And if you send a package like that, imagine a clerk opens that and gets wounded. After that, they strengthen their defense and their security. And then you have still to carry that task, but have to avoid all that security and somehow neutralize that. So security, oh, special services, they carry out their tasks without much fanfare. I need to remind uh, our viewers the grim destiny of all those uh, so-called leaders of so-called Donetsk and Lugansk areas. So what's the percentage, Alexei? Uh, how many of them were killed by Ukrainian special services versus uh, by their own? Well, you know, we officially did not kill anybody. And uh, it also could be quite a bit of infighting. That's always a factor in these things. But I just cannot imagine France, uh, French services sitting there and uh, discussing, let's send a package and see whom it kills. Um, I think they're much more likely to send a guided missile into the headquarters or an airplane with uh, some munition. Package is, uh, is an amateur hour. 
I think it's their own internal figuring out. They're probably fighting over some gold or diamonds or something else and started sending packages to each other. That's an interesting version. But do you think they sent boxes and packages to Ukrainian embassies, Wagner's? I don't know, Mark, who's doing that, but those ritual dogs' eyes and explosives, it's almost like, it looks like an African cult. I don't know, Mark, this, it doesn't need to be African. There are a lot of shamans in Siberia and other parts. But the eyes of the dog, that sounds like a Dagame cult. It, some could be related to the voodoo stuff. I don't know, maybe, perhaps, but one understands that it's Russian special services or their Wagner troops who are doing that campaign. But the apologets of the Russian House and the Central African Republic, uh, God, f please explain me what does Russian House need to do there. Anyway, I think that's an inviting. Okay, we have a lot of people joining us on the last part of a show, over 300,000, uh, and we are on the last questions. So, package 9, it was implemented. There are different uh, localized sanctions against certain companies, very direct, but we are always paying attention to the personal sanctions because I know, Mark, I know, Mark, you like the personal sanctions. I do. Indeed, I do. You have something personal, right? Yeah, I do. I definitely have a chip against them. So, besides Nikita Mikhalkov, the cultural leaders and figures, Kachevnikov and uh, a rather playful figure, Karchevnikov, who's that? There is a Boris Karchevnikov. He has a show in Russia One, and I think he's a editor in chief of uh, channel Spas. Uh, I think it's a religious channel. And there is also Puchkov. That is a complete ass. He was uh, voicing over some of the movies earlier, and he is actually um, an ex-cop, uh, and he's also a Stalinist. And yeah, he's anti-Ukraine. Are you talking about the guy with the Nick Goblin? Oh yeah, Goblin, that's the one. Hmm. Um, Valia, that's another one. You don't know her? Which one? Valentina Tereshkova, the cosmonaut. Yeah, she's uh, not exactly a full-scale cosmonaut. There are a lot of interesting things that happened around her flight, but she was married to Nikolaev, who was a military pilot, pretty distinguished uh, specialist. She divorced him later. She was also a rather playful figure in social life. Golikova and others, the list is pretty long. Interesting list. But tell me, package number nine, it is being implemented now. How much of continuation do you think will follow? Because we heard the Americans are also preparing some sanctions as well. And do you think the work on the next one will uh, intensify and the gas corridor? Probably nothing till New Year. But we should note that we are coming into this New Year celebration with Kissinger and uh, mentioning of his uh, suggestion for Russian troops to withdraw. And one of the strongest mechanisms, if they do not withdraw, would be personal sanctions. And I think continuation is inevitable, and uh, increasing the degree is inevitable. So you think these lists will be expanded? Definitely. If you make offers and they do not accept them, and they do not do anything, they do not stop doing what uh, you're telling them to stop, then you need to escalate. And if the previous didn't work, then you need to expand the stimulus base. Um, you need to make them more painful. So, commission of Yermak Makfol is working, right? Oh, absolutely. Ukrainian National Security Council is also suggesting council, uh, suggesting ideas, right? Oh, yes. And there is another organization, some of my friends from Moscow uh, rem reminded me, there is another organization, they are somewhat uh, in the hiding, they are uh, swimming low, 
This is the Federal Chamber of Attorneys. Uh, very KGB, FSB people infiltrated. The conflict there is that those four regions that were so-called joined to Russia by that uh, hasty referendum, in autumn they are creating legal entities for these uh, territories, which, as you understand, is right, international war crime, that's what it is. And they're covering themselves with, oh, that's our order. Well, we talked about that, you know, the previous tribunal already in Nuremberg already outlined that an order, a criminal order is not an excuse for the one who carried it. So it's Friday, let's spice up their life. I do have a chip against these people. They at some point revoked my attorney title because I, of my tweet, because I tweeted about them calling them Kremlin underdicks and um, yeah that's um, that's why they revoked my status so using this uh, tribune that I have here I'm uh, sending it back at them and bringing them back on the radar anyway um, I appreciate all of you viewers who joined us over 300,000 over 100,000 of you clicked the like button. Please subscribe to Fagin Life, to Alexei Rostovich if you have not done that yet. And of course to the Privateer Station if you are listening or watching that in English. Tomorrow is Saturday. We have everything according to the schedule, right? Oh, yes. Um, and Sunday will be the final of soccer, so probably will be other things. But we'll see you tomorrow and talk about everything. Goodbye, Alexei, and goodbye, dear viewers. See ya.